Next on the agenda, we have um, uh, Dr. Barry Wills, um, and he's going to give a keynote on the birth and evolution of minerals engineering journal. So Barry has over 50 years experience in the minerals industry, commencing with four years industrial experience with Nchenga Copper Mine in Zambia and Mathy Refiners in the UK. After 22 years at Camborne School of Mines as a principal lecturer and then head of minerals engineering department, he left in 1996 to form MEI, a family business specialising in minerals engineering conferences and dissemination of information on the minerals industry. He's author of the textbook, uh, Minerals Processing Technology, now in its eighth edition, but I don't think the edition on my shelf is the eighth, uh, and was the founder, uh, editor of Minerals Engineering Journal, from which he retired in July, 2022, after 35 years as editor in chief. He's a recipient of the IMPC's Distinguished Service Award and IOM3's Medal of, for Excellence, and in, is an honorary professor of the Central South University in China. So welcome, Barry. Thanks, Virginia. And um, before I start, I'd like to say how honoured I am to be here, to, be a, to have been invited by the IMPC and by the OzIMM to give this lecture. It's been a long haul getting from UK, but I think it's been worth it. So uh, thanks to everyone. And um, you'll see from my, the title of my talk that it's 1969 to the present. And um, although I've founded the journal 35 years ago, the process, the story starts at the birth of my um, career in minerals engineering, because there's a lot of interactive um, episodes, which you might find are trivial, but they're not trivial. They're all interesting. At least I find them interesting. I hope you'll find them interesting. But these all lead up to the birth of uh, minerals engineering, which was, which was 35 years ago. So I'm going to go back to 1969, to September 1969, when my wife and I uh, left Southampton and embarked on the Windsor Castle en route to Cape Town. It's our first trip outside UK, so it's a major undertaking. And we eventually arrived in Cape Town. And on board the ship, we had a totally inappropriate car for African roads. We had a, a, a white sports car, uh, Triumph Spitfire sports car, completely useless for Africa. And from Cape Town, I drove two and a half thousand miles up through South Africa. We crossed the Limpopo River into what was then Rhodesia, all the way up through Rhodesia, crossed the Zambezi into Zambia, all the way up to northern Zambia uh, on the border with the Copper Belt, to the Enchanga mine on the Zambian Copper Belt. This was my first job after graduating from university. I was a metallurgical engineer. But basically, I was a physical metallurgist. I knew absolutely nothing about mining when I arrived at, uh, at the mine. And basically, this was just going to be a, a brief episode in our, uh, in our lives. We spent a few years there. We'd enjoy the Zambian life. We'd see as much of Africa as possible. We'd have a few adventures. And we certainly did that. But I did learn a little bit about mineral processing, particularly getting my hands dirty. But I didn't learn much about the kind of theory of mineral processing. It's basically the practical aspects of mineral processing. And to be quite honest, my heart wasn't really in it. I was more interested in playing sport and having a good time. And I played every sport imaginable. And believe it or not, I was even a competitive weightlifter but it was 50 odd years ago, don't forget. Um, but after four years, we decided the time was right to leave Zambia and return to the UK. And the UK that we returned to was in a mess. In fact, it was almost the same as the UK I left about six days ago. Um, in fact, it's even more of a mess now. So it was awful. You know, when we left Zambia in 69, everything was good. Came back, they had a Tory government and it was bad. And I couldn't get a job. It took me a long time to get a job. I was thinking maybe I would go into the steel industry in Sheffield, but the steel industry was on its knees. But eventually I got a job and it was with the Johnson Mathy refiners near Cambridge. And I was working on the um, processing of PGM ores from South Africa. I hated it. I just hated the job. 
And after nine months, I was getting desperate. I was pulling my hair out. <laughs> after nine months, I decided, what am I going to do with my life? You know, this, this is crazy. And then one day I had an experience which you could call a sliding doors experience. You know what I mean? One of those trivial episodes which completely turns your life around. I was wandering through the offices one day, one dismal day, and um, I saw on one of the desks an airmail magazine. And I picked this airmail magazine up and I saw it was, it was um, a mining journal. I'd never seen a mining journal before. I flicked through it. There's nothing there really to interest me because I wasn't interested in mining. So I threw it back down on the bench and uh, I must have thrown it down face forward because I then looked on the back of the uh, journal and on the journal there was an advert. It was for a senior lecturer in mineral processing at the Camborne School of Mines in Cornwall. And I thought That's, that sounds quite interesting. I'd actually never heard of the Camborne School of Mines which really shows how ignorant I was of mining because uh, at Enchanga, the general manager and the assistant general manager, I found later, were graduates of the Cameron School of Mines, or CSM as, it, as it's called. Um, so I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Although I didn't know what CSM was, I knew what Cornwall was. I'd never been there, but it was this mystical place miles away, the land of pirates and shipwrecks and Cornish pasties. And I thought this re sounds really interesting. And I also heard that it was the best place in the world for scuba diving, which was one of my other passions. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll, I'll, I'll um, apply for this job. Nothing will happen. And I was surprised when a couple of weeks later, I was offered an interview. So I rushed off to, to Camborne and I was interviewed by the head of mineral processing and by the principal, uh, Dr. Peter Hackett. I didn't realise at the time that uh, Camborne was not only renowned as being one of the best mining schools in the world, it had a big reputation for sport as well. And um, Peter Hackett seemed to be more interested in my sporting achievements than he did in my knowledge of mineral processing, which, believe me, was very fortunate for me. And um, within a few weeks, I had another surprise. I'd got the job. So we were off. We were off to Cornwall. Now, Cornwall is, if you don't know where it is, it's down here in the extreme southwest of Great Britain. This is Great Britain, this big island here. It's in the extreme southwest of Great Britain and the most remote part of England. England's in red. When we got there, we were immediately captivated by the place, by its rugged landscape and its incredible uh, coastal scenery. We just loved it and we knew that this was the place we were going to stay in. But also it brought about a big transformation in me because very slowly I developed an interest in mining because I found out that Cornwall was regarded as being the birthplace of modern mining. In the 18th and the 19th century, centuries, it was the major producer of copper and tin. And all around the county were these iconic engine houses, which in the 19th century housed the steam engines of the Industrial Revolution. And there were hundreds of them, because there were hundreds of mines in the 19th century. And many of these um, engine houses were perched precariously on, on uh, cliff tops. And when I looked at these, I saw that most of the mines had two engine houses. They would have one very big one, the big one was for pumping water because the Cornish mines are very wet. And the small one would be for oisting the ore. Where, where did, how did the miners get down, I thought. Well, I'll come, come to this in a few minutes. Um, but obviously these, these engine houses were loved by the tourists, they're loved by, the, um, by photographers, they're loved by artists. But I often wondered how many of these people who saw these engine houses realised the hardships that the miners suffered underground. It was a very, very hard life and a very, very short life. And um, sorry, I keep looking loud. I've got a screen down here. This is a photograph taken on one of the tin mines near, um, near um, Camborne. And this is at the 400 fathom level. Now, 400 fathoms is two and a half thousand feet down, which is very, very deep by 19th century standards. 
The miners in Cornwall always measured their depths in fathoms to reflect their seafaring, um, to re reflect the fact that they're, they're all basically sea seamen. And um, also, the man in charge of the mine was called the captain. So that's a term which has endured throughout the world as the miners went out of Cornwall. Mine captain is one of the terms which you'll, use, you'll, you'll see everywhere. Now this picture is remarkable. It's remarkable for two, th two reasons. First of all, it's a superb picture. You know, if any of you have taken pictures underground, you know it's very, very difficult. And most of the time, it's quite disappointing. But this is a superb picture. But it's particularly remarkable in that it was taken in the 1890s. And in the 1890s, photography was in its infancy. And it was taken by a Camborne man called J.C. Uh, called uh, Burrow. And Burrow made, made his, um, it was his mission to go around all these deep mines and take photographs to show what the mine, what it was like underground. And it was pretty arduous. I mean, you look at this picture here. This was one of his pictures. The conditions underground were terrible. They, they were ill lit. They were lit only by candles on the miners' caps. They were poorly ventilated, very poorly ventilated and very, very dangerous indeed, and hot, about 40 degrees centigrade. Terrible conditions and dangerous. I mean, look at this. This is um, how the hanging wall is held up by just a few pieces of Norwegian pine. So, Burrow didn't have a modern camera. He had a camera such as this one here, a big heavy plate camera re re requiring very, very long exposures. He would need a very big, heavy tripod. He didn't have a flash gun, so what he, he would illuminate all his pictures using magnesium flares. And all these had to be transported underground. And they were transported by ladders. This is one of his pictures here. It shows the miners coming down by ladders. Now imagine going down two and a half thousand feet underground just by ladders. Most of the mines in Cornwall, that was the only way of transporting the men underground. They would go down by ladders. And it could take between two and three hours to get down to their place of work. Now you imagine coming up the ladders at the end of the shift when you've been working in 40 degree heat with poor ventilation. Um, the fatality rate on the Cornish mines was very, very high. And most of the fatalities occurred just by the miners falling off the ladders, just due to exhaustion at the end of the shift. So it's a very, very hard life. And um, this really piqued my interest in mining. I was really getting into mining now. And um, I was also falling in love with the Cameron School of Mines and with its students and with its staff. And I was one of three mineral processors on the, on the, on the mineral processing staff. Um, the oldest was a man called Frank Bice Mitchell, who was nearing, nearing retirement. He'd written a book called um, the practice of mineral dressing, I think it's mineral dressing, and that was published in 1950, so it's well out of date. And he was also a world expert on tin processing, and he was also renowned for bringing froth flotation into Cornwall, <coughs> not to treat or not to float copper or tin minerals, but to float arsenopyrite, because arsenopyrite is a very dense mineral, and it reported into the uh, tin concentrate because cassiterite is also a very very dense mineral and it had to be removed because if the arsenopyrite or the arsenic got to the smelter it would be heavily penalized because arsenic in tin makes a very very brittle tin so it had to be removed and before flotation came about it was removed by calcining and this was done in um, big furnaces which heated the, or, uh, heated the concentrate up to about 800 degrees C in the pr presence of oxygen or air. And this drove off the sulfur from the arsenopyrite, a sulfur dioxide, which just went into the atmosphere. There's no EC ESG in those days. So that went into the atmosphere. Um, the um, arsenic then reacted with the oxygen to produce arsenic trioxide. And that was condensed into these, in these labyrinths, long labyrinths, as a white soot. And periodically, men were sent into these labyrinths to dig out 
the soot, and this was probably as dangerous as working underground. You can imagine it, all the arsenic fumes and all the dust flying around. But they did have protection. They had a piece of gauze over the face and they had two pieces of cotton wool bunged up the nose. And that was basically it. So it's a very, very dangerous occupation. Anyway, that's what uh, Frank Vice Mitchell was um, involved with. The other mineral processor on the staff was someone you, you probably know. It was Dave Osborne, Dr. Dave Osborne. Now, Dave Osborne is still very active. He's with Anglo Coal in Queensland. And Dave was about the same age as me, and we became very good friends, and we still are. And Dave had a vision. He'd seen all these old books in mineral processing, such as Frank Bice Mitchell's book. They're all out of date, and many of them were very voluminous. So he had this vision of producing a textbook for students, which, was very, which would be very, very basic, and it would be up to date. And he asked me if I'd like to join him as a co-author. And fairly foolishly, I said yes. And so we set about the task and we split it up into chapters. I would look after flotation, he would look after gravity, and so on. And then just as we got into the project, he decided he'd had enough of academic life. So he shot off to South Africa to seek his fame and fortune in the coal industry, and he became very, very successful. So I had a dilemma, what am I going to do? Am I going to abandon this project, or shall I do it on my own? So I decided to go alone. And after four years, I managed to complete it. And I found a publisher, which was Pergamon Press in Oxford. And the first edition of Mineral Processing Technology was published in 1979. Now, when I look back on that book, it really was very, very basic indeed. But when I look back on the 1970s, mineral processing was very, very basic indeed. Um, if you look at, for instance, um, grinding, if anyone had worked on a mine in the 1930s, they'd have been very much at home on a mine in the 1970s. Very, very little had changed in terms of mineral processing. Um, grinding, the final stages of grinding was done in ball mills, lots of little ball mills, all in, running in parallel, sometimes up to 20 of these mills running in parallel, each one of them closed with its own classifier. Similarly, flotation, small cells, many, many cells in a bank, sometimes up to 20 cells in a bank, all very small and many banks running in parallel, each one doing its own, exactly the same duty. So nothing really had changed in 40 years. But two years later, things changed dramatically. We entered the third industrial revolution, which was the computer revolution. And gone were these uh, consoles, big um, computer consoles of the 1960s. These were now replaced by very powerful, or very powerful by those standards, very powerful mini computers, or they were called desktop computers. This revolutionized everything, and it brought about new fields of research, modeling, simulation, automatic control. It was now possible to control plants using a computer. And to control a plant using computer, obviously you need instrumentation. And you couldn't instrument all those tiny ball mills or all those tiny flotation cells. So the modelers started to look at the design of equipment to make it bigger make it bigger so less instrumentation would be required. Flotation cells got bigger and who would have thought that flotation cells would ever get this big? Sorry, that big. <laughs> and, um, or that grinding mills, ball mills would get so big that the ore itself could be used as the medium and so autogenous mills came in and more importantly semi-autogenous grinding mills uh, evolved. So I got really interested in this. I mean, I'd, I was now a mineral processor, there's no, no doubt about that. I got very interested in this. And I got quite good, I suppose, at um, programming computers. And I developed quite a bit of software for, for, minerals, uh, for minerals treatment. And one of the things I did was, was produce a, um, an automated method or computerized method for metallurgical accounting, metallurgical auditing of plants. And someone suggested to me, well, you should try and publish that. And I'd never published anything before. I didn't know much about journals. And um, I knew that the most important journal, international journal, which all the senior 
um, researchers sent their papers to was the International Journal of Mineral Processing. And the International Journal of Mineral Processing was uh, owned by Elsevier, published by Elsevier, which was based in Amsterdam and Oxford. So I sent my paper off, I wrote a paper, sent it off to Elsevier. Nothing happened, heard nothing back. And this was, these were the days before email. So I wrote to them, nothing happened. I phoned them up, nothing basically happened. So I basically pestered them. And eventually they published the paper. But the paper was published well over 12 months after I'd sent it, which I thought was, was crazy, you know? So I talked to senior um, researchers. I wasn't a researcher, I've never been a researcher, but I talked to senior researchers and I said, what's going on? And they said, that happens with the International Journal of Mineral Processing or IGMP as they called it. It says they've got a monopoly. Um, basically, they can do what they want. You know, they take the time, do what they want. Uh, there's no competition. I thought, whoa, no competition. That's interesting. Now, by this time, I had a very good re relationship with Pergamon, my book publisher. My book was going into a fourth edition. I could talk to them easily. And one day when we had a meeting, I said to them, would you be interested in... Um, a new journal which has exactly the same aims and scope as the IGMP, but publishes rapidly. And I, th I thought they'd laugh it off. And they said, yes, yeah, sounds a good idea. Um, what would you like to call it? And I said, well, I don't want international in the title because we've already got IGMP. Can't use mineral processing because they use that. Let's call it minerals engineering. And they said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll go ahead. We'll, um, we'll draw up a contract for you and uh, you can be editor-in-chief. I thought, well, that was easy. <laughs> uh, but believe me, it wasn't easy because now I run into a typical catch-22 situation. I've now got a new journal, but how do I get people to put papers into a journal which no one's had any interest in whatsoever? A new journal which... Um, has got no reputation at all, run by a young upstart who's got no experience whatsoever of journals. It was difficult. Luckily, Camborne supported me, and uh, they said, I've only got seven minutes left. <laughs> I've got a lot to say yet. Uh, <laughs> Camborne supported me, and uh, they sent me off around the world. And, um, I talk to people, and if I could give one message to all the young people in here, the most important thing you do in your life is talk to people. Talk, talk, talk. That's what I did. I networked. And um, eventually I got people to put their papers into the journal. And shortly I managed to get enough papers to publish the first issue. And the first issue was published in 19, January 1988. Um, it wasn't bad at all. If you look at uh, the contents list, we've got some people there who are pretty well known. Um, Bill Johnson put a paper in, um, Sub um, Subramaniam, uh, Eric Forsberg, uh, Gilles Barbary, Jim Finch. So it wasn't bad. We were on our way. And um, it, was, um, it was launched officially at the IMPC in Stockholm in uh, 1988. And I always get a bit embarrassed when I see this picture with the 1980s fashions. My son says I look as if I'm just about to go into bat. And, uh, <laughs> but it was launched there. And this was my first IMPC and a strange one, a weird one, because um, I felt a, a kind of chill in the atmosphere. Um, and I found out that there's an IGMP mafia. Um, basically, a bunch of academics, mainly American academics, who were vehemently opposed to this new journal, Minerals Engineering. And during the conference, I was approached by the uh, publishing manager of Elsevier, and he warned me off. He says, you cannot go ahead with this toy journal of yours. He says, uh, you must drop it. There's no room for two journals with exactly the same aims and scope. Drop it now. And I thought, this guy's worried, you know. Uh, maybe even more determined to go ahead. And I went ahead 
and very slowly momentum built up we got papers coming in and a lot a lot of that was due to uh, a very strong editorial board that i've put together from people around the world who had met and the editorial board met for the first time in 1991 in singapore and you might recognize a few people here um, that's um, rob dunn who's a consultant in australia uh, Glenn Dobby in Canada, that's me, still in my cricket gear. And that's um, Professor Wakamatsu from Japan, I don't know what happened to him. Uh, Terry Vesey, long retired in the UK. Cyril O'Connor, who's here today, um, who's, who's the outgoing chairman of the IMPC. My old friend Dave Osborne, and the guy at the end, many of you will know, Don McKee from uh, the JK MRC. We were really on our way. Things were starting to move. Two months after this um, picture was taken, our world completely fell apart. Because Pergamon Press was run by the notorious Robert Maxwell. And uh, Robert Maxwell was known to be a bully. I only met him once, and he was an awful person. Uh, I met him once, he was a bully. He, ruined, he run Pergamon with an iron fist. And, um, he was found to be corrupt. In 1991, he was also found to be corrupt. And just after this picture was taken, he died in very mysterious circumstances. And after his death, Pergman basically imploded. It couldn't go on. And uh, it was ripe for takeover. So a few companies put in bids, and the bid that was accepted was Elsevier. Okay. So um, Minerals Engineering now became part of Elsevier. And people said, well, it's going to fold, obviously. Like, you, you had a nice three years, but that's the end of it. So I rushed up to Oxford and I said, um, as I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip a few. Um, I rushed, rushed up to Oxford and I said, look, you can't, you can't get rid of this journal. The mining industry is now very important. The ores are getting um, leaner. Mineral processing is becoming important because of that. The ores are becoming more complex. Innovation is coming into the minerals industry, we need two journals. And I, I mentioned um, all the new enhanced gravity concentrators. I mentioned uh, column flotation, which was dominant in those days. Every conference you went to was dominated by column flotation. Didn't really make it reach its potential, but it did lead to new developments, such as the Jameson cell, which is now ubiquitous around the world. In um, Comminution, we had high pressure grinding rolls taken over from rod mills and coarse grinding machines, coarse crushing machines. We had stirred mills introduced by Bill Johnson and his team at Mount Isa for grinding these um, ores to very, very fine sizes. And so things were changing. So Elsevier said, yeah, go ahead. We'll, we'll run the two journals together. If things don't work out well, we'll drop minerals engineering, no problem. So um, we ran them. And we, went, we, we carried on then for um, the rest of the 1990s, pretty smoothly, into the 21st century. The big development in the 21st century was Science Direct, where um, people could now download papers rather than just taking a, a hard copy and photocopying an article. They could download these articles. And Science Direct was really good for us in that we could now judge the performance of the journals on the number of downloads. And when I see the number of downloads from Minerals Engineering, I couldn't believe it. You won't believe it when I tell you. Um, in each year, Minerals Engineering has about 500,000 downloads, about uh, half a million. It's a staggering amount, much more than IGMP had. And also, by looking at the downloads, we could see which areas of mineral processing were becoming more important because of their downloads. And it was quite obvious that it was um, sustainability, particularly water and energy. And um, I'm going to skip these because, can I, can I carry on? Yeah. yeah. Um, water and energy. When I started my career at Camborne, no one really gave a thought to water and energy. We knew, for instance, that the mining industry was one of the world's biggest consumers of energy. And we knew that mineral processing was one of the biggest con contributors. We knew that grinding was one of its biggest uh, 
sources of um, energy, of, of utilization of energy. And we knew that ball milling, of all the energy put into a ball mill, only about 1% was used to grind the ore. But nothing was done about it. It was known, but you know, we live with it. That's the way it is. But now people are looking at trying to reduce energy and water. And I think probably the most important development, the most exciting development for me is electronic sorting. Electronic sorting within the crushing circuit, scalping out coarse particles at a very coarse size, reducing water, reducing energy. Electronic sorters have been around for a, work, for a, for a while, but they were originally used for diamond processing, but now the sensors can detect a whole range of optical properties, including the grade of individual ore particles. So this is going to become more and more important. It's a very, very important development. Within flotation, going back 30 years, all the research in flotation was to do with fine particle flotation. Now it's coarse particle flotation, trying to get rid of the particles as coarse a size as possible, reducing water, reducing energy. And so we got devices such as uh, the Aries hydrofloat cell, which is just for coarse flotation. We got Graham Jameson's um, Nova cell, which is said to be the universal flotation cell for coarse particles and fine particles, developed at the University of Newcastle, and also the University of Newcastle have got Kevin Galvin's reflux um, flotation cell. So all these things were driving mineral processing. And now I'm coming to the end of, um, end of it now. Um, just mentioned comminution, high pressure grinding rolls. It was quite obvious that high pressure grinding rolls were grinding finer and finer, made rod mills obsolete. Stirred mills introduced for ultra fine grinding were taking coarser and coarser feeds, making probably ball mills obsolete. And I wonder now whether the sag mill is going to be made obsolete. Will the tumbling mill in a few years time go the way of um, stamp mills as they did? A century ago, will it become obsolete? And an important development which will um, be highlighted at Comminution 23 next year is stir mills are now being developed for dry grinding. Now, if we've got dry grinding of stir mills and these particle sizes overlap, then we've got a completely dry crushing circuit. And the other advantage of um, the electronic sorters in the crushing circuit is that they're a dry operation as well, unlike heavy medium separation. Okay, now that's basically the, um, the end of it, but not quite, because there's a twist. There's a twist to the tale. Remember 35 years ago that Elsevier said there's no room for two journals, Minerals Engineering will have to go. Four years ago, Elsevier said there's no room for two journals, um, one of them will have to go. But now there is no competition. IGMP was just very gently put to sleep and Minerals Engineering became the dominant journal, or the only journal. And it was um, revamped uh, with a new cover and also a completely new editorial board, uh, an editorial structure. I remained as editor-in-chief, but I now had five editors under me from uh, all around the world, from UK, Canada, Turkey, China, and Australia. All very young, dynamic professionals and I said to Elsevier, look, I'll carry on overseeing the journal until I'm absolutely sure that these people can run it properly. And, um, you know, I can, I can leave it in good hands. This year I've decided I can leave it in good hands. And the um, new editor, some of you will know him, is Dr. Pablo Brito Parada from Imperial College. It's in completely safe hands with Pablo. It's got an exciting future. It's got an exciting future because mineral processing has got an exciting future. So that's the story so far. It's been an absolute roller coaster ride, it really has. But it's always been interesting and it's always been challenging. And before I finish, I'd like to thank all of you because I think most of you over the years have been involved with minerals engineering in some form, whether you've been authors, whether you've been uh, peer reviewers. We've got thousands of peer reviewers or had over the years, thousands of peer reviewers, and I know it can be a thankless task, and it's not paid. So thank you all for that, and also for the editorial board, past and present, quite a lot of them are in the audience today. So thanks 
to all of you, and thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.